You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Welcome to the Foundry today. We're going to look today within our series of Evangelion. we're going to take a look at encounters. There's an encounter that takes place within the Christmas story that I think is worth looking at and, and kind of studying through a little bit. It's amazing what an encounter can do to you as a person. I know this. For me, 2018 was a super weird year for the fact that I met a lot of like celebrities. I, I met Adrian Peterson, got a picture with him. I met Mel Gibson. He didn't want a picture with me, which I understand. He doesn't want paparazzi chasing him because of me. And um, I also met, um, the, the other day, like two or three weeks ago, um, I, I saw Chris Pratt from like six feet away. I was like, oh, dude, that's Chris Pratt. I didn't talk to him because he was busy. But um, I've seen these people. I've had these encounters. But uh, the most memorable encounter I had last year was when my daughter, Bella, she wanted to go to Toby Mac's Hits Deep Tour. And uh, I was at Van Andel Arena. So one Sunday, he was playing that night. I decided, you know, better late than never. I'll just go down and get tickets. We drive down. We had lunch, then we go to get the tickets. My family's kind of in that post, like, church morning after a big Sunday meal kind of coma, like, oh, sitting in the car. And I said, anybody want to come in with me? Nobody did. Good. I wasn't hurt. I wasn't mad. I just said, all right, I'll be right back. I parked fairly illegally, and I booked it into Van Andel Arena. I'm standing in Van Andel Arena. It's me, a lady at the ticket booth, and then I turned around, and there's this guy there, and I was like, hey, are you Toby? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, that is awesome. I'm Eric. I went up, shook his hand, talked to him for a minute. I was like, my family is going to be mad jelly that I got to meet you today. Can we take a picture just for evidence? He's like, just totally. And like, we're stood there, you know, he kind of did the awesome sign. I'm in my 40s. It's hard to be awesome, but I did my coolest look. It looks sad, really. And we took a picture and I texted my wife right after he took off. I'm like, I just met Toby Mac. My daughter went bonkers. What? Eric is like, no way. And I come out, I show him all the picture. And it was awesome. I had this encounter. And you know, a lot of people will say that um, for me, it's, you know, Eric seems to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, okay. Other people will say that um, I'm looking for those encounters. I'm always watching for someone worth seeing. That's a terrible thing to say. But um, I'm always watching for those encounters and those things. I would say this, that today will reveal to us that it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. There is a bit of right place, right time, and there is a bit of, I'm looking for it too. And we see it very clearly in today's sermon, uh, in today's teaching, where it says this, out of Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 21. It says this, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee, up in the north in Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. Remember last week, Joseph, son of David. Anywho. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to a firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields. They were living nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone all around them, and they were terrified. The angel said, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, Bethlehem, a Savior has been born. He's been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths, laying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels praising God, and they were saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So they hurried off, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what they had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary, Jesus' mother, treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, When it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Today we're going to talk and look through the idea of keeping watch, of keeping watch and this encounter. We're going to go through this kind of rhythm two times. We're going to talk about what it means to keep watch for a shepherd. It says that the shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks by night. See, in Judea, in these foothills, there were a lot of rocky, craggy places, a lot of places for sheep to get injured. And the shepherds would corral them tightly, get the sheep kind of together, settle them down, lay them down. And then one of them or a few of them would keep watch at night while some others rested. The shepherds were keeping watch. They were in the middle of their job doing the mundane while also... They didn't realize, but they were prepared for the extraordinary. They were preparing themselves for the extraordinary. See, this is the thing. In the mundane, you just keep, you keep an eye out for, well, a sheep maybe wandering off a little. You say, hey, come back here, Fred the sheep, and you put them back into the fold. But they were also watching for the extraordinary. What if a bear snuck up and got into the flock? They were watching for predators and different things, the extraordinarily scary things about being a shepherd. They were doing the mundane, mundane, protecting and being ready for the extraordinary. It makes me think of like a beat reporter. You know, like a beat reporter, a reporter who, um, who writes the news stories and you'll see them like camped outside of the White House or in the Capitol building or in London or you'll see them in Jerusalem. And they work a beat and they constantly are keeping watch for a story, for a lead to pop up. They're always kind of eyeing what's going on. They know who the movers and shakers are. They're going to see if anything kind of bubbles up, if a story appears. That's kind of our modern equivalent of what's going on here. How do you keep watch? But also the shepherds went about their business and then something happens. They believed what they saw and what they heard. They believed what was told to them when the extraordinary thing happened. And when they believed, they said, let's go see this thing that has happened in Bethlehem. They knew it was true. They expected it to be true. Because this encounter with the angels had changed what they thought their night was going to be. In keeping watch, they were given news that they had to chase down. Go back with me to that reporter analogy, that beat reporter who's on the beat watching for a story, and when they sniff a lead, when they see something that maybe in some way tells them this is a, this is a thread worth pulling, find the story, go work out the lead. When a reporter thinks they have a big lead, they chase it. They chase the lead. They go in search of the story. And I think that's an important reality that um, holds water again with our you know, modern day equivalency of what the shepherds did. They chased the lead. They chased the story. Just like a good beat reporter would if he found the, the lead taking place. So when, when this happens, they chase the lead because they believed it. Then they encounter the risen Lord. The shepherds encounter Christ. But in verse 17, we see that once they saw Jesus, once they saw him, it says they went and they told the everyone. They just shared the news. They shared the news with everyone who would listen. These ordinary shepherds who had been about their mundane work had this extraordinary experience and now they were sharing the news with everyone around. This amazing thing that God had done, they were telling the news like crazy. They were excited. They were sharing the good news. And again, like a reporter, you you wait for a story. You do the mundane beat work. But then 
you get a lead and you chase it. And then once you find that story, what do you do? Do you sit on it? No way. You publish it. You get it into the hands of every major publication you can. Online, print, you get it out there. Why? Because it's a story worth hearing. It's a story worth hearing. A reporter who's done this publishes the news. A shepherd who's been encountered by the angel and the host of heaven singing praises to God and telling them of the birth of Christ would go out and share the news. And in verse 17, that's exactly what they did. But that wasn't the end. It wasn't just a sharing. There's this, this follow-up that takes place where they actually just praise God and give thanks. In verse 20, there is a return to work. They go back to the mundane, but look at the posture of their return. They come back to their flocks, they see their sheep, they're lying there, and what do they do? Do they just go back to the mundane? No, they're praising God. It says they're praising God and giving thanks. Their response was to return to their profession, but to return praising God, giving thanks. To the mundane focus, they kept that, but with that mundane drudgery of their job, they now added praise and worship towards God for what he had done and the good gift of this baby that was born to them. Their profession continued. Now their profession was made purposeful by Christ being inserted into it. They go back to their jobs of tending sheep. And what I love about this is in doing their job, they begin to worship God for what he's done. At work, they engage in church. Seeing the shepherds engage back in their normal lives um, praising and giving thanks and encountering God in this, in this way and then being transformed. It makes me ask and kind of beg the question of the church, of you, of me, and, and say this, what step am I on? What step are you on in keeping watch, in believing, in sharing the good news, and in praising and thanking God? For what he's done in Christ Jesus. What step are you on? Where do you find yourself in that story? I think the best way to apply this is to go right back through those things and, and focus the arrow a little bit more back into our own application of where we're at. First of all, keep watch. Now, I know I could ask it this way. Where are you? Where has God placed you in life? And you could say to me, there's a lot of mundane drudgery. Eric, I'm a mom who, um, who's trying to take care of little kids. It's an endless cycle of meals, diapers, laundry, um, just busy work. And it seems like once I get one thing done, I'm back to doing. It's, you know, the, the thing again, it's just this cycle. It's a cycle. And um, it's hard to keep watch when you're constantly doing. I understand that. I understand that. You could be like, Eric, the grind is long for me. It's long sitting in the excavator, sitting at the job site, standing at the thumb press, wherever you're working. It's long. It's mundane. But here's the thing. So is it, it, it is for you as it was for the shepherds. It is for you as it was for the shepherds. There was this mundane. There was this thing they were doing, but they were keeping watch. In the middle of the mundane do we still believe in the extraordinary encounter of God to us? And I think for us, we have to look at it and ask the question, are you doing the mundane while looking and expecting the extraordinary? Remember, the shepherds did the mundane of keeping the sheep from wandering off, but they also stayed awake at night in case the extraordinary happened and a bear or a wolf or a lion showed up, right? Are you doing the mundane with an expectation and, and a watching eye for the extraordinary. Not just in life circumstances, but in God's circumstances. Are you watching for God to show up in your life and do something you, um, you maybe weren't ready for or weren't expecting? My, my challenge to you would be pay attention to the moments where God is breaking through. Look in your life and see where God is breaking through. You have to keep watch because I know this in my life. God speaks in the still quiet moments. Never in the mad hectic pace. And with this church, with our family, with the way we kind of operate, 
it can be like pedal to the metal. You crawl out of bed and you hit it and you go to bed tired and it's, it's, there's not always enough time in the day to keep watch. There's a lot of time to do. And for me, I found this. God loves to break through in my moments of quiet and rearrange my day, rearrange my focus. And I'm learning. I'm not there. I'm learning to carve times where I can pause and watch for God to break through. I can keep watch for God to do extraordinary things. I'm asking you to join me in it, to join in the work of the shepherds, of keeping watch in the mundane tasks of life. Don't let the mundane things we do own us. Keep watch for the God who bought us back with his own son. Keep watch for him breaking through into our world and using you as a means of grace and reconciliation. Keep watch. Keep watch because God breaks through in those quiet, mundane moments sometimes. And when we see it, well, it leads us right into our next spot. 2018. Do we believe? What do you believe? Maybe 2018 was the year you met Jesus. And you came to a point of belief. And you found him to be your Lord and your Savior. And he's all you ever wanted and all you ever needed. And you find that in him he is your all in all. And it's been this wonderful year. Maybe, two th- maybe for somebody else 2018 was a long year added on to a series of many years before it of knowing Jesus. And your faith walk had gotten a little mundane. But do you believe Do you believe like the shepherds did? Do you believe so strongly that you will go and you will follow the lead? You will follow and seek after Christ because maybe for you this year, God has spoken. Maybe God has spoken and it's been a challenging word where you are called to believe in what God said maybe many years ago or maybe just this past week. You are called to believe what God said and live into it. Live into it with His power, with His Spirit. You are to believe what God said in your life and over your life. When God has spoken, directed, and guided, here's what I want to encourage you in. Don't waver. Don't waver. God's Word never returns empty. God's word matters. When God speaks something to you, when he impresses something on you, don't waver. Believe what God said and chase it. When we believe something, we go after it. We go after it. We get after it. We really pursue it. So for you today, I'm encouraging you, believe and let your belief be evidenced by your active following of what God's spoken over your life. There was a lady I met when I was 21 years old in my discipleship training school in Harpenden, England. Her name was Christina Kruger. She was, um, at the time, I think she was 57, which when you're 21, that's like elderly. Now that I'm in my 40s, she was as young and spry as could be. But she was a widow when I met her. Her husband had passed away. And I was 21 in a discipleship training school. She was 57 in a discipleship training school. And I said to her, Christina, why are you here? And she said with that awesome Afrikaans accent that I can't imitate, Eric, God called me to missions as a young girl. And I didn't obey then. Now is my time to obey. She believed what God had spoken all those years before. And she didn't say her family was a mistake or anything. No, she loved them. But she followed God because she believed all those years ago he had spoken. God speaks. If we will keep watch, we will hear him. His word will speak. His spirit will move. He will speak. The question is, do we believe him and follow bravely like Christina did back when I was 21 years old? It's an amazing idea to think that God speaks and leads his people into an invitation of obedience. I invite you, believe what God said. Don't waver on it and follow whatever he gave you to do. Go be what he called you to be. After we believe, we see the next kind of step or movement in the story is the shepherd shared the good news. And one thing we don't understand in our cultural context is who these shepherds were. 
There actually is a specific identity to who these shepherds were. And there were things they did that I think will uh, maybe uh, enlarge your understanding of the Christmas story. Cindy Nyhoff did a great job of researching this and sharing it in the devotions. And I'm so glad she did. I learned from it and I want to share it with you. The shepherds in Bethlehem would most likely have been Levitical shepherds, shepherds from the tribe of Levi, who the tribe of Levi were the priestly tribe, and their job was to present for sacrifice lambs that were unblemished and unharmed in any way. They had no spot or blemish. That's part of the Torah. These shepherds would take the little baby lambs when they were born and they would wrap them in cloth and often keep them safe and warm in a cave so that they didn't, as little lambs with shaky legs, bang into things and get injured and get a blemish. They would wrap them in cloths and keep them safely in a little hillside stable, a cave. Imagine with me what these Levitical shepherds thought when the angel said, you will find the Messiah wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, in a little cave in Bethlehem. See, Bethlehem's about seven miles from Jerusalem, so that's why the Levitical priests would have tended sheep out there. It was close to the big city. Do you see what they're hearing? When they come and they see Jesus, do you see how extraordinary this is? That this Christ child is the Lamb of God. This Christ child is in some way the spotless, sinless, perfect sacrifice. And for them, the Messiah took on a whole new twist. They couldn't help but go tell the good news. Because when they went and said, hey, there is a new baby boy, boy born, the Messiah, and he's born in Bethlehem. And I mean, wonder of wonders, this little child is just like the sheep we've been raising. He is spotless and without blemish, and he is wrapped in cloths and lying in a stable that would have told people this is a lamb to sacrifice for the sins of the people i just think that's amazing they had to tell the good news we know it to be true we know that jesus died on a cross to forgive and redeem us from our sins and buy us back but also give us purpose and meaning separate from our past and engaged in our present by his power we know that. Culturally, we know that. They didn't. It would have been like the most mind-blowing event of their life to understand that the Lamb of God had been born, this Messiah. I love that they couldn't help but share the good news. And I challenge us, I think almost weekly, go tell the good news. Don't come to this church and think, oh, they'll believe eventually. Go tell the good news. Go share the good news just like the shepherds did. Go be part of the story. This testimony the shepherds gave would have impacted everyone who heard it. They would have heard it as the Lamb of God had been born. It's a beautiful, more full understanding of the message the, the shepherds received and the way they told it next. I, I just love that part of it. Finally, praise and give thanks. This one is fairly easily approached. After this holiday season, we all go back to work and maybe our pants and sweater is a little more tight because we've had the holiday season, right? We've had these big meals and the parties and all these things celebrating the birth of the Lamb of God. But we have to return to the mundane. And my challenge to us as a church, as, a, as me as an individual, is to return to the mundane with an eye keeping watch out. Um, amid the duties we have, the responsibilities we have, keep an eye out for the extraordinary event of God breaking through and speaking truth into our culture, into our context, into our lives, so that we can be people who remake culture and we can be people who define this generation's impact for the gospel by listening and keeping watch, not just in the extraordinary moments, but in those quiet little moments of mundane. That is where God speaks. So how do we do this? I think we reorient our mindset around our jobs. We go back to work and we praise and give thanks to God for what he's done in Christ Jesus. When we go back thankful, praising God, it transforms the way we engage the mundane. It transforms the mundane into the divine, the extraordinary. What we're doing now has purpose, even if it's going through spreadsheets 
even if it's finish nailing cabinets, I don't even if it's teaching, if it's legal work, I, it doesn't matter. Whatever you do, whatever your mundane is, go to it with praise and thanksgiving. Bless God for the opportunity you have to come back to your mundane with the baby story of the Lamb of God born for the sacrifice of our sins, that God sent Jesus Christ, that indeed Christ has come and his life, death, and resurrection has secured for you and for me an eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation. Out of that news should come the praise and worship of the church. And I invite you to join me in it, to join us in a season of gratitude at Christmas, but also in an extended season of praise and worship back at our everyday ordinary lives because that's where God shows up and transforms the mundane into the extraordinary. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, we have attended to your word and we've looked at it closely and so we just ask right now that you would quiet us down and that you would show up, that you would break through and show us who you are, what you're doing, and why you love us. And that you would call us into a life where we keep watch, where we believe and chase the story of Christ. And then where we share the good news, we publish that story out to the wide world. And finally, God, where our lives just turn back in praise and adoration of who you are and what you've done. Today, God, we just pause and ask, will you help us live lives that are ever mindful of the extraordinary gift of God breaking through into this world in Christ Jesus. And they be participant with you where you're at work. We love you, Lord. We bless you. And we thank you that for us, Christmas is Mary because of Christ. So we celebrate heaven's greatest gift as a community, as individuals, as families. May your grace be felt by us in this season. And may our worship be felt by you in this season as well. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.